I've pretty much been a cook my whole life and the one thing I can categorically tell you is that if you don't have brilliant ingredients, you're never going to be able to create an amazing plate of food. And I was lucky enough to have grown up in the great outdoors. Most of the time I caught or prepared or harvested my own food, grew my own vegetables, caught my own fish. Nowadays, however, we put our faith and trust into retailers to provide us with good food. But more often than not, they don't have our best interests at heart. And if you just think about a motor car engine, would you put dirty car oil into your motor car? And the truth is you're going to say no. But when it comes to food, well, we'll put anything in our mouths just because it's packaged and we believe that it's good for us. And this got me thinking, where does our food actually come from? Where is it caught, processed, harvested, and slaughtered? So over the next couple of weeks, what I'm going to do is hit the road with all of my crew and find out where good food actually comes from. Human evolution. It kicked off for us when we were little more than scavengers. We lived off the land, learned to hunt and gather, all the while while trying our very best not to be eaten. As time ticked by, we moved up the food chain and got smart, or so we thought. Nowadays, well, we rely on others to produce our food and we do most of our hunting and gathering in supermarkets, unaware that our eating habits are having a massive impact not only on us, but on the environment as well. My name is Justin Bonello, and this is my journey to find out where the food I eat actually comes from. We're about to drive out of Cape Town. That on my right is Cape Town out of the way, and there's a viewpoint here. So this is a cheers, and it's also time for you to meet all my crew. We'll start off with Craig, the sound guy. It's Craig. Hello. And Sunil. Danny, Louis, our stills photographer, Darren, uh, the camera guy, John, Calvin, producer, Hello. Megan, production, this is Doc, Hello, guy. this is Martin, Hola. Hola, and the blonde on that side is Raylene. And that's all of us. What I didn't tell you was why are we here? Saying goodbye to Cape Town, but just over the hill down the valley is the small town of Krabo, and we're going to be checking out a very, very noble bird, the chicken. Let's go. I think you're about to have your eyes open in terms of how our noble bird is produced. And there comes Sean. What's that for? No, is that, you don't need that. That's okay. That's for those who don't have boots. For those who have boots. Thank you, ma'am. I haven't put a white coat on before. Dr. Bonello. Do you want to go into the, the youngest ones? Show me the whole thing. Because it's very cute. Yes, know? yes. So you don't really eat your cute friends. No, you don't. That's where you know little girls and boys draw pictures of chickens, and it's all happy, and it's in a big open field. And all the foot dips are because we don't farm with antibiotics and medication. We try and keep all the germs and diseases away. Gee whiskers. If you went into a big commercial house, you wouldn't see ground. There would be jam-packed like that. It would just be chickens everywhere. We've got 15 birds a square meter. So this is only, oh, it's like two thirds of the house. Yeah. Um, and they're sitting at 25 birds a square meter, the, the commercial guys. We believe in fresh air yeah. for health. So. so fresh air constantly flowing through. Our heaters are on. You can feel it's warmer yeah. here. So you winch the entire curtain up. 
on the length of the house, the house. and then they all just they go, go in and out as they were. Yeah. When I'd been researching it, they were saying that um, the, the rule when it came to free range was that they had to have access to the outdoors, but then um, that the, like the commercial growers would make it so difficult for them they wouldn't even be interested, you know, it would be one little door leading out onto like five meters of space. Yeah, our standard is the size of your house inside, which is more or less a thousand square meters, is repeated on either side of the house. So they've got twice what they have inside, they've got outside. I have to pick one up. Go for At some point, you're um, going to turn into a Sunday roast. <laughs> I like the way they've got a little like, spring as well. These chicks are broiler selected genetically for their growth potential for what the commercial farmers use. So we're using the same chick so we could get the growth. And if you wanted to do real free range, you should get birds that are not developed for growth. But then you're looking at 50, 60, 70, even 80 yeah, days. And we've looked at that. It's, it's just not economically wow. viable. Not yet. N not yet. These chickens are never given hormones. So I have it on my label. They are growth promoter, growth hormone, antibiotic free, and they're drug free. And what's the difference between a growth promoter and a growth hormone? Well, Doc, what's a hormone? Uh, hormone is, a, is, is, is something that occurs naturally in animal yeah. that you artificially enhance by injecting or you know, okay. getting into the animal. And a growth promoter can be a lot of things. So antibiotics in chickens can be a growth promoter. That's the, the other side of it. You, if you want antibiotics, you have to go to your doctor and get a prescription. But for someone to put that into my food, they can do it without asking my permission or asking my doctor. I have a right to know what's in my food. Yeah, we get saying. sick in yeah. our family. We go out and buy a commercial chicken because we get the meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's the truth, you know? Well, I'm going to put my foot down and I'm going to say, that's it. I want to know. Thank you. We're going to a small house now and, and they're much more, they're already starting to scatter. Best chicken I ever ate, best chicken, was one that was slaughtered up in the mountains, in Lesotho, in the mountain kingdom. And they slaughtered it for us and we ate it the same day. The meat was like red, it was dark meat. It tasted almost like venison and the fat was that yeah. thick on it and it was bright yellow, you know? So that's double the age of the ones that are down there, and they double the size. Yeah. Now the that's older amazing. sheds open up 100%. Really? The whole side. You can go in and out. They can go anywhere here. They can go anywhere. Oh. On, the, on this thing, and then they go back to the same one. Oh, so sometimes not, good. sometimes they get a bit confused. They're not marked, so we don't really know where they go <laughs> I back could imagine hey, 70,000 birds a week with Johnny, a little old, yeah, yours go that way. No, that's brilliant. On the one hand, um, I'm a cook, but the truth is, what do I actually know about my feet? Mm. What do I actually know? So this is very refreshing. I think it's a great trip that yeah. you're doing because you're getting to know what's in your food and exactly. what you should have and shouldn't have. Thank you. Okay. So we got chicken catching tonight. Well, then. it's going to be fun. If you can't catch a two-day-old <laughs> chicken, how are you going to catch a six-week-old Well, chicken? I'll give it a bash. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna get a quick grub up for all of my crew. And the way we're gonna cook them is in these. And yep, this is a cooked oven. First gotta make a hole in them. Now you can use an old 25 litre paraffin drum, whatever the case. I'm using a brand new paint drum because I don't wanna poison my mates. Smart, you can help me here, bud. The nice part now is we're just going to chuck all our veggies between the two here. And when this cooks, the fat of the chicken is going to drip into the bottom here as well and really help flavor those up. Obviously, on the chickens, I'm just going to do a bit of a, a butter herb rub with some sage, some garlic, parsley, some salt. I'm going to rub that all over and in the birds. I don't feel like getting these beautiful hands all dirty with butter and everything, so smart as the fortune to do it. And I want them to really massage the birds, you know, really rub it into those breasts like that. And being a young fella, he needs all the practice he can get. Now, the amazing part. 
We're going to slide these chickens down over the stake. Now, you can imagine, what's going to happen is I'm going to slide the drum over this and it becomes an oven. And basically, once we build the fire around it, we forget about it for two hours, come back to dinner. So here we go. We're on our way to Warwick's farm to go and catch chickens. Because I want to know how my free-range chickens are caught. And Warwick's one of the Beaumont brothers. And Nothing's going to be straightforward here. Mr. Benello, good evening. Good evening, man. Hello, sweetness. Got another little one that just had to come down to say hello to you. How are you? Fine. <laughs> there's a part of you that's going, well, here we go off at night, you know? <laughs> and tomorrow morning there's 6,000 less chickens on the farm. But you can hear the little chirp, chirp, chirp in the background. Yeah. Obviously, when you turn the lights down, the stimulus is, is off, so they, they all calm down. We leave them for about 10 minutes and then we'll come in with the, with the trailer. You want to try and pick them up like that? Yeah. Okay. Round the wings. Yeah. Okay, that they don't flap. Yeah. And we will pop them in like that. Okay. Okay, obviously if you pick them up like that, you're going to get your hands, they flap, you're going to get so. bruises on the wings and that sort of stuff. So you want to just try and get the whole bird like that, with your yeah. pinkies yeah. Round, the, round the drums there. Yeah. And put them in here first, and there we go. Okay. So you want to try one while the lights are on? Sure. Yeah? You don't have to sort of jump it. Yeah? Well, I'm it's just jumping there. I've never They're done that before. Calm about this whole affair. Yeah. He's not even phased. Well, he doesn't know what's coming. No, well, I mean, it's not that he's panicking and saying, oh, my well, nerves, where am I going to now? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. They have to actually think it is, uh, it's time to go and sleep. You see them hunkering down together here? Yeah. yeah. Get a little spot. And that's it. Well, well, they are going to sleep, but it's just a big sleep. All right, well, let's start the big sleep. Switch off the camera. Or switch off the lights, I should say. So we've got, uh, we've got three, three inside, inside crate. that crate. We've got another five. Another eight, five. Eight in a crate. OK. Yeah. Well, that's you number four. OK, you, uh, okay, you catch our cut. Four. Well, well, Come on, catch, catch I can't the chicken. even see them. We've got now five. Yeah. Six. Okay, six coming in. Six thousand, sorry, five thousand nine hundred and ninety-four to go. That's it. And number eight. And number eight. OK, right, so we've got one. One times crates, crates loaded with, with, uh, with chicks. <laughs> Up we come. Switch the light on. Whew. Um, no one tells you about the smell of the ammonia in there. That's, uh, listen, that's, uh, that smells special. <laughs> real farm. <laughs> real farm gets like a full dose. I see the guys are like machines just in here. Huh? You imagine now the guys go in and just pick up five in this hand and five in that hand by the No, the, like the commercial guys yeah. you're talking about, where they they're do that, just a... and then they carry ten birds by their feet, and that's where the rejects and the broken legs and everything, everything come. From them and the wings and away. the wings flap. Yeah. So they break their wings, and then they go into the crate. All ten birds into the Straight crate. Straight in. From the chicken in the hand today to this one, I mean, yeah. You gotta go home and eat the chicken in the drums. No, I'm going to. Am I invited? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and eat something. <laughs> Is it ready? Is what I want to know. No no, 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 no. 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 I could eat a chicken now. Very hungry. Also, this is what happens when the, the cook is in the, in the hen house. Yeah. <laughs> Just as they look lacquer, eh? Book oh. some. Okay, buddies. Scrubs up, everyone. Martin's the carver. When the juice runs out clear. That's one way of telling if a chicken's cooked. The other is when the, the thigh leg comes out of the socket easily. Like that. Just like yeah. And it's just falling apart, eh? That's brilliant. A noble bird. Beautiful. I mean, it's just soft and elegant, actually. First time in my life I've ever been exposed to the other side of how food is produced. And if anything, it makes you think about where your food comes from. And that's only the beginning part, because tomorrow we still got to go and check out the, the free part of free-range chickens. And then after that, we have to go to a, 
an abattoir to a slaughterhouse. Because at the end of the day, from clucking chick to table means somewhere along the line something does that. But all in all, a good day. It's 6.30 in the morning and we're now travelling to South End Farm and after seeing the, the five day old chicks and the seven day old chicks and the ones last night that go to slaughter and I want to see how much truth there is behind these free range chickens. She said, say biohazards. Their big worry is us, um, is transmitting disease from one chicken house to the next. Morning. How's it, Justin? How's it, Davi? Nice to meet you. We're going to get some weather today. It looks like it, eh? What's it? Red sky in morn, shepherd's warn, red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Good. Morning. Hi, Justin. Hi, Justin. Hi, Rory. Nice to meet you. It's like an exodus when they start going, I guess. The earlier you open up the sheds, the more they run. And in winter, we can't open up too early because it's just too cold. Too cold for them, yeah. And they're still developing their feathers and yeah. all the rest. Right. All their down, I can see, is going as well. There's very little left on these guys. There's less stress in a system like this because they've got more space, space to, to roam around. Yeah. How many in a commercial shed? They'll stock up to 22 to 25 square meters. So, like, when what's it a year on about? A third less in yeah. the same space. They'll, they'll, they'll range right up to the right up to the fence. And they'll flatten the grass, they eat the grass out, outside there. They just it looks like a lawnmower has been over. Well here comes the rain. I'm not the only one hiding out from the rain. We've got some of the farm workers also tucking under the zinc sheet to get out of the rain. Chickens live to be up to 10 years old. So if you equate that purely to days, 3,600 days. We are so clever as the human species that we figured out a way to turn little chicks, little, I mean, little chicks like that, into a Sunday roast in approximately 40 days, 40 days. So let's take that, let's say it's 3,600 days that that chicken lives for and 40 days that this chicken lives for the percentage of its natural life that it gets to live is 1.1111%. And if you equate that to a human, let's do the same mathematics. Human lives to an average age of 70. Let's kill it at 280 days old. It makes you think, doesn't it? Because that's basically what we're doing with our chickens. And listen, I'm not saying I'm not gonna eat chicken. I'm gonna eat chicken. But I certainly want to know that its life was as good as it could be. You know, I still want to get down on my hands and knees and give thanks to our very noble bird. We're about to go and see the end of the line of our noble bird. We're on our way through to the abattoir to see how our birds are slaughtered, processed, packaged and then sent on their way to you. And I don't think any of us are really ready. Well, I'm glad I'm not going to be the only one who looks like this. I'd like to just tell you all that you look particularly stunning this morning. I think this should be the new cooked uniform, eh? Hey? <laughs> when you go into the plant, you're going to wash your boots, you're going to wash your hands, and you're going to sanitize your hands. You must sanitize them, OK? Oh, it's really no different to how you would clean a fish. You know, you're going to cut it up the gut, pull out all the intestines and the gut so that you end up with a fish with none of the internal organs. And that's what you're seeing here, all the internal organs. Listen, Aiden, I'm very impressed. And there's a bird passing me every second, every two seconds. Uh, yeah, it's about, we do about 1,000. 800 an hour. An hour? Yeah. And what, do you run a normal day shift? Yeah, just a day shift. Just a day shift? Yeah. You know what always gets me? Is that we're smart enough to figure out how to build this machine, but yet on the production side, 
on the growing side, how come the guys aren't smart there? That they, they aren't on, like you? You know, how can they justify it? A complete disrespect for that noble bird. So it will, it will change. It will. Sure. So what happens here is these people will select what is a whole bird and what must go for portioning. It's quite a process, eh? You see, I, I always know when my birds are free range because there are stones it's in there. In their diet, see. yeah. That would never happen in a commercial place. No, well, in a commercial place, they, they, they can't use, um, well, they use an automatic um, lizard harvester, as they call it. The lizards will go through and will actually be cut by a machine and cleaned out, but we can't do it because the stones break the rollers. I, I want to show you in my airline chiller. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be very noisy. This is the chilling room where they call the chickens down. In most commercial operations, what they'll do is cool them down in a fecal soup, a water bucket where all the sh is washed around in the bird. And this gets delivered to your doorstop. Just like that, bang, bang. Yeah. You don't like the how we look at it, yeah. killing the birds. Yeah. But from when the birds get hung up on the shackle when they're alive, yeah. we, we have a short space until when they go, then they get stunned, electrically stunned. Yeah. So I, I compare it to having an anesthetic prior to being cut open. Then, yeah, they don't know an operation. It. So they don't know. We do not kill them with electricity, we only stun them. And I can see they're coming across unaware. And then. Every bird's throat just gets slit here and bled. Alive, stunned, dead. It's that simple. We need to make it as efficient and sterile as possible. That's the yeah. requirement from the customer. Sure. And I'm with you, I'm one of those customers, you know. I don't know whether I've been so sanitized over my lifetime that I'm so disassociated. It's not like I'm slaughtering my dog, yeah. you know? It's just a chicken. But there is still something... I mean, it's, an, an, it's, it's a sign of how we live our lives as modern human beings, you know? Yeah. It really is. Here we all are. Seeing them shake a bit when they go through the stunning bath, and then 10, 20 minutes later, defeathered, through the line, cool chilled, and into portions, yeah. and we eat it. That's the process. That's human beings for you and what they eat. But thank you, John. You know, I think out of it, I'm going to come out with a greater respect for the animals that I do eat. Yeah, thank you. I definitely would still eat chicken though. I think, I don't know, I think we, I think... You I mean, kind of I, need to see something of... like that though. Yeah? You kind of need to see something like yeah, that. You, you either see a whole chicken or a dead chicken, you never see what's see chicken. Back to our home. Our time at, um, on the Kromerafir. Kromerafir farm is coming to an end, but for our last supper here, we are having a, a dinner with Jean and Bryn at their house. Tina and Gareth and Warwick and Lisa and a whole lot of other people are coming. 24 of us settling down for dinner. And finally, someone's gonna teach me how to make a chicken in, in dough that's edible. <sighs> I'm speechless just to be out in the space, dinner table set, everyone's going to start arriving just now, we'll put the food on the go, and that's that. In South Africa, we do a thing called kea. It's an Afrikaans word which directly translated means visit, but it's a lot bigger than that. What it is, is getting all your friends together, your neighbours, it's a good glass of wine, it's conversation, it's gesellig. Conversational? I think that's the right translation. 
And that's what's about to happen. Cheers to Martha. So my time with the very noble bird is now coming to an end and the last of the guests are finishing their wine and are about to go home. And I really only have one thing left to say, and it's actually a challenge. The challenge for you is to go out and buy yourself two chickens tomorrow, one free range and one commercially produced bird, and to take them home and cook them exactly the same way. And then do a blind tasting on your friends and family and see which one tastes the best. And I know the answer to that already. And then try and make a decision as to which chicken you would like to eat. What's it, growth? What do they call it? No, it's not hormones. No. At least these chickens were... Come on. Let's do that again. And park off over here, buddy. It's a lot warmer. Oh, we're packed and ready to go. And today we're driving 700 odd kilometers to Klochlin, which is about two hours out of the mountain kingdom of Lesotho. And tomorrow we drive up to the Kutsi Dam in the mountain kingdom and check out the story of a well-traveled fish. Human evolution. It kicked off for us when we were little more than scavengers. We lived off the land, learned to hunt and gather, all the while while trying our very best not to be eaten. As time ticked by, we moved up the food chain and got smart, or so we thought. Nowadays, well, we rely on others to produce our food and we do most of our hunting and gathering in supermarkets, unaware that our eating habits are having a massive impact not only on us, but on the environment as well. My name is Justin Bonello, and this is my journey to find out where the food I eat actually comes from. It's seven o'clock in the morning and I'm waiting for Greg Stubbs to come and take us down to the ponds and why we traveled for two days from the Karoo up into the mountain kingdom of Lesotho to the Motobong village is to check out aquaculture. Worldwide, our natural fish stocks are under severe strain and aquaculture or fish farming might just be the solution. But I wanna know how it's farmed and eventually ends up on my plate. And Greg Stubbs is the stand-up guy that's gonna be showing me where my farm trout come from and uh, better get used to this this is my Lesotho attire it's called a balaclava and no I'm not robbing a bank today <laughs> but it is fresh morning how are you morning, morning. it's not too bad today no it isn't huh I thought it was gonna be a lot colder colder yeah let's walk over onto the food shed okay perfect so, Greg, fill me in a bit. It started as far back as probably 2002. We were scouting to find a spot to grow fish all year round. That's actually what makes this whole place unique. Most other farms can only harvest in the end of the winter. Whereas up here in Katsi, we can get the cycle going where we can harvest all year round. The, the fry, not the fry, the eggs come from eggs. overseas. Yes. Then the fry get hatched in three streams in Franschhoek, typical South Africa type thing. Brought up to the mountain kingdom, grown, harvested, and then back home again. <laughs> it's a well-traveled fish. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Morning, Mike. Yeah, morning, guys. I'm not going to pull my gloves off this morning, eh? How are you? That's all right. So what's in the feed? That's going to be the big question. Yeah. The feeds we're using here in South Africa have got a protein content of about 42%, fat to oil level of about 10 to 12%, and then there's vitamins, and minerals, and a bit of binder. But the nutritional value that the fish is getting is coming mostly out of the fish oils and the protein. And the protein source 
comes mostly from fish meal. Well, I mean, how much feed do you go through? I mean, uh, a day. Well, we at the moment, we're using nearly 50 bags a day. And that's basically a ton of fish, if you think, yeah. more or less? It's, it's a ton of growth a day. That's, that's yeah. what you're aiming at? Yeah. They're going to follow us down. Should we walk down to the Let's fence? Let's walk down to the barge. Oh, we'll down we'll down see you down there. there. We'll see you down there. <laughs> no, you haven't shown your bank robber outfit to anyone yet, eh? Hey? Yeah. Hey? <laughs> It's peaceful, that house, it's beautiful. And you'll hear too, if we stayed on shore when they were feeding the fish, when they feed them, it's just a commotion. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I was hearing that um, all the indigenous species of fish have figured out to like hang out around the nets. So when you feed, anything that goes through the nets, they just yeah. nail down. It has attracted the indigenous fish. Sure. The local fishermen also fish around the cages with their, with their canoes. I don't fly fish as much as I would like no. to. Yeah. Oh, we all don't, eh? Yeah. But then you've got to take me here. I feel like uh, it's a treat, you know? But we're going to go tomorrow, eh? OK. Definitely. I'd love to do that. Spend a, spend a day out there, maybe. See the guys coming down. Oh, the water's crystal clear, eh? Another reason we obviously push to get the site is the extraordinary quality of this water. When you're cooking or processing the fish from all the different farms or different areas, you can absolutely taste it immediately, you know, which area it's from. So you sometimes get um, species of algae growing. When the concentration of that algae is too high, then the fish picks it up and you get like a muddy taint to the fish. And it's not, everyone thinks, you know, it's because it's fresh water or because the fish are eating mud or whatever, but it's not. It's the actual algae, algae in the content, water. That's trout, my biggest problem that I've trout I've caught is always that tastes like they mud. Taste mud. You, well, you joke, you say, you take your trout, you wrap it in some nice mud, you put yeah. that on the fire, yeah. you let it cook for a little bit and things yeah. until the mud goes all hard and the yeah. fish is cooked inside. Then you crack it open, throw away the fish and eat the mud. <laughs> <laughs> But that's but that, I mean uh, no, but I mean uh, you, that explains it to me yeah. that that fish and when I think about it, it didn't grow up in a spot like this, yeah. you know, it grew up in a farm dam and you think you're out there oh, I'm going fly fishing, I'm gonna catch myself a nice little trout and things and I'm gonna eat it. Yeah. And that's what you're actually getting, where the condition of the water will make and it and art makes sense. It's all to do with the environment, it's in. I feel guilty, I've got to help the guys when I can't stand back here. <laughs> huh? Greg's walking off to fetch us another boat because he's worried about us on the barge, but I'm going to climb on the barge in any case. When I go out to sea with a bunch of locals and we're hunting fish, here we're feeding fish. Watch what happens now. Now you can see all the little fingerlings coming up for a chow. Just sounds like it's simmering. But when we do the big fish, you're going to hear it boil. Every morning you do the small one first, then the next small one, and the small one, and then the big ones. OK. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. It's not traditional farming like you know it. You've got no history to work off. So it's a constantly changing industry. Yes, just look at that. It seems like a lot of the mortalities come from, from birds, you know, that uh, sit here and just tick, tick, help themselves to a free lunch. <laughs> Now we're about to hit the big tank. <laughs> How's that? The water's boiling, man. I see the boats coming in the distance there, so I think what we'll do is jump onto this boat and explain a little bit more about what's actually going on. Yeah, we'll hop in with you guys here. Kia la boa. Thanks, guys. Aquaculture is basically in its infant, infancy. Infants, uh, infancy. <laughs> <laughs> Tongue twisting today. But uh, it is. I mean, it is it's, it's, it's still figuring out how all the systems kind of work together. You know, it's, it's a technology we've created, what, in the last 20, 30 years? 
I mean, the world population, they say, will be, uh, by 2050, will be somewhere around 9 to 10 billion people. And they say that's the maximum carrying capacity, you can call it that, of the planet. It's scary. I mean, I, I won't be around anymore at that point. We're custodians of the planet for our kids, aren't we? I yeah, mean, that's we what we ought to be doing. Natural wild caught sea fish, there is no more coming out. They're at their terminal limits. Virtually every fish is in decline. Yeah. I went out to Tuna Grounds, yeah. um, followed a hack trawler in. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's. And yeah. it's not even um, one man fighting a fish anymore. It's yeah. technology fighting yeah. a fish with the, the fads, the fish attracting yeah. devices, the yeah. GPS yeah. systems, yeah. the knowing, the ocean mapping. Yeah. I mean, we are very smart. Yeah. We're just not smart enough to manage it. Yeah. You know? yeah. We're smart enough to be greedy. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, how many thousands of year, years ago did man move away from being a hunter-gatherer? Yeah. Yet in the sea, we're still just hunting gathering. You know, it's scary. It really is scary. All future seafood growth will come out of aquaculture. You know, that's, there's no doubt about it. It's already it's gonna have to. Already, it's, it, it accounts for about 40 to 45 percent of all seafood consumed is coming out of aquaculture, and by value, it's more around about 50 to 60 percent. So, as we go in towards 2050, I mean, everything, all the future growth or the seafood demand is going to come out of it. But what we got to do is be responsible about it. You know, how to do it in a, in a responsible manner. These must be very close to a kilo now. 800, 900, yeah. So what we're aiming for is to get these fish to um, a minimum of one kilo, yeah. but we actually want to get them up to 1.5 kilos yeah. um, to give us better yields in the processing plants and yeah. give all these um, the nice sort of thick portions. Yeah. So now, I mean, what's the carrying capacity that you guys have done on the research for Cutsy? We've modeled this top section of the dam, and the reason we're using this top section, this is where the major flushing happens. But that's also what makes this such a good environment for them. It's, it's not only this unbelievable water quality, um, it's also the temperature profile on an average through the year here is just about perfect for carp. When it gets really stressful, I walk over to the fish farm and feed the fish. <laughs> it's therapeutic. That is, it's, it's therapeutic. Don't you want to just throw a few time? And I want to put a rod in, you know, that, <laughs> that's what I want to do. Should we go back for some breakfast now? I'm getting a, bit, a, a, a hot cup of coffee and, uh, you know, something warm to eat. That's good. That's so beautiful. This morning's been quite an interesting introduction for me to aquaculture, to farming of fish, you know. Um, this journey that I'm doing is all about where does our food actually come from and I've been eating three streams trout for five, six years and never thought about where it actually comes from. So to be up here is quite interesting and you know out of all the farming practices I've seen so far, aquaculture seems to be one that has the latitude to really develop into something special. So let's see what happens over the next couple of days. Now the interesting thing for me is following the whole process. I've gone out this morning, I fed the fish with the guys. Well they fed them, I was an observer. I know the fry are arriving tomorrow morning, which is like really the beginning part of the process. But the end of the line for these trout is when they get euthanized and refrigerated and sent back to Cape Town to turn into smokefish or trout that you get on your plate. But in typical fashion, in order to do that, we first got to fix the boat motor before we can go harvest the trout. Greg, you take the, the fancy boat, I'll go on the barge. <laughs> so, just so I understand the process, we're going to net fish out of the, the pens. Yeah. Then we're going to chuck them in here. Yeah. The clove oil is an anesthetic, so what, right. it stops them from breathing? or It's a more of an anesthetic, as in the, the, the true sense of an anesthetic. So it paralyzes them yeah. virtually, it stops yeah. them from working, so they're not running water over the gills. 
Can I have a sniffer there? <laughs> I smell like alcohol, I'm not going to drink it, eh? No. <laughs> is this the trick? We feed them a little and get them close by. That's right. I suppose it's, it is like clubbing seals. Yeah, yeah. Look at those beauties, eh? Yeah. Okay, watch it. We're going to come in with it. Greg, okay. It's come in Jeez, this all happened so quickly. Yeah. What a must do. Yeah, they look in good condition. I can see how quickly they go, yeah, hey? That's right. Yeah. The last little. Yeah. Hey, phew. <laughs> there we go. He's in perfect condition, eh? Yeah. And then you layer them up with ice. That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> Revenge of the fish. <laughs> if they splatter me again, I might have to eat one of them. But this is like a 16. For 12 to 16 months of graft. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Hard work and feeding, yeah. He ain't so happy. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay. Back to shore. You know, this uh, journey into food is really turning my own thoughts on its head completely. And the ones that came out of there at table weight looked beautiful. In many respects, you expect to see them damaged and thousands in small spaces, but it's not that. The fish look beautiful. They look so very similar to the ra wild rainbow trout that I've caught. And once Greg's fancy speedboat calms down, here's just the sound of the sea too. And so begins another beautiful day. We're going up to one of the tributaries that feeds the dam to try and catch wild fish, not farm fish. How's that, Greg? A bit fresh this morning. You look like you've got frost on your shoulders. Look, are you shaking? There's frost all over the boat. <laughs> no ways. We'll only do this for you. Yeah? <laughs> only for me. Thanks, then. Fishing for our supper. Well, lunch, maybe. <laughs> I want to do an experiment. I want to try a wild trout and I want to try one of your trout. Okay, perfect. Listen, if we don't catch, we have a plan B. <laughs> a serious plan B. <laughs> Frost. The only thing that I'm really concerned about is that I can't fish with my gloves on. <laughs> It's dead, eh? Yeah. They're very inactive at the moment. Come okay, fishy, fishy, fishy. And these fish are hibernating, it's so cold. I'm gonna give it a bash around that water coming in. This is why I like fly fishing. Yeah. It looks so good, eh? You one would expect a fish now. Greg, we might be reverting to your plan B, huh? It does to me. It's funny to think that like um, if we had to catch wild trout to feed the world, imagine we'd be screwed. <laughs> huh? We're solving. Greg, thank you very much. Thank you. It was I, fun, although we didn't catch you. Know, you know, it is getting out there. The only thing I have to figure out now is what to do with the rest of my day. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the rest of my day. I'm going to spend it trying to outsmart a trout. It's that simple. The way I see it, two rods in the water might make a difference. Even if the one has no idea what he's doing, <laughs> he'll probably catch the fish. Let's give it a bash, huh? Bring the rod tip down then to shoot it out, you know? Uh, OK. Oh. 
I think I just hooked myself. <laughs> Bloody hell. Tick, it's got a fish. You got one? No, he has. Just this. Is that it, bud? Are we calling it a day? I do feel a bit defeated, but um, I just think we do it again tomorrow morning. Sure. I have a confession to make. I lost another one of your flies. <laughs> <laughs> have you just been practicing so casting? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, they are a beer each, eh? <laughs> <laughs> sure. God, speaking of which. Craig. OK, Dave, I'll give you a shot back, eh? Thanks, cheers, bye. You're checking up on your fingerlings, aren't you? Oh, uh, I am indeed. <laughs> <laughs> How did I know? And? No more, no, nothing. Okay. I'm going to give it a, one more bash in the morning. It's my last day in the Motobong village in the mountain kingdom of Lesotho, and I'm still fishless. Two days of fishing, and I have caught nada, nothing. But I'm going to give it a last bash. And then when the fingerlings arrive from Frontchuk, I'm gonna go and check that out. But this is basically my last chance to catch a fish. Yes, God! Ah, look at that beauty! That's a rainbow trout, wild! I'll come back here, don't, please don't come off. I'll be... That is a beautiful rainbow, wild rainbow trout. Look at the beautiful condition of that trout. Unfortunately, <laughs> and sorry, buddy, unfortunately. This is the end of the line for you because you're part of my experiment. <laughs> I don't want to lose it, you know? <sighs> Day and a half of fishing for one fish. Sorry, bud. Listen, it's uh, not the biggest trout no, I've ever caught. No, not at all, but it's a trout. It's a trout. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well done, buddy. <sighs> Listen, now the trucks, the fingerlings are coming earlier, do you know? Oh, cool. I'm quite excited, because this is like the all coming together. How are they looking? I'm still nervous, because you? Yeah, you really don't know until you start so, floating. Or floating, really. This is the moment you've been waiting oh. for for three days. I almost didn't sleep last night. <laughs> I'm sure. Hey? Yeah, you keep, you keep worrying. Well, again, they lose these, and your whole cycle gets thrown out down the line, and it impacts on you. Even I'm excited, man. Greg, you're like an expectant father. <laughs> They're tiny, eh? They're tiny, or they're less than one gram. Is it looking good or...? No, it's still a bit difficult to tell. I think we'll let the guys do the, the water Straight change. Yeah. Then we'll be able to check Judge. them out when we, all, when we all play it, yeah. My curiosity is like, I want to know what's going on. That's beautiful. Beautiful, live baby trout. It's fantastic. It's oh, that's brilliant. The majority are live, which is just such a relief. I really am relieved. I really sure. Oh, man. When you've been doing this for so long and you it goes like that, I can relax now. You can see. <laughs> you can see. Um, sorry, I can't. <laughs> Don't cry on me now, Greg. I'm going to have a quiet moment. <laughs> I can see. Shame, eh? He's so relieved. Yeah. And I think when you're putting your heart and soul into something and it works out, that emotional release. Yeah? Shame. That's the sound of little fish travelling a little further. <laughs> oh, welcome to your new home, little guys. Well, Greg, I'm going to leave you be. OK. But I think it's time to eat some fish. I think so. It's pointless seeing the whole process if we don't eat the buggers. Okay.
But we're going to eat a wild fish, a wild trout you caught. The one I caught and, and one, of, one of our farm fish. Yeah. Great. Looking forward to it. I'll see you a bit later. Okay. I'm just going to do two or three different types of fish. The first one involves smoking them, and that's basic. You see, we fillet it, put salt on it to draw out all the excess moisture, and then I'm going to smoke that. The other one I'm going to do in a tinfoil parcel, stuff it with a parsley, butter, black pepper, and salt, and pour wine all over it and let it bake on the fire. And one I think I'm just going to do straight on the grids. The last thing we've got to do is rinse these off, pat them dry, and smoke them. Okay, Mike, time to take a peek, eh? There we go. Whoa, look at that. You. <laughs> I always love it when a plan comes together. Okay, you want to hold that and we get another board? Thanks, Smarty. Justin, is that the trout that you caught? No, you've already eaten it. You didn't even know the difference. Hmm. So this is only the beginning of this journey I'm doing to find out where my food comes from. And so far, let me tell you the most important thing. The whole reason aquaculture exists nowadays is because our oceans are under severe pressure. If the oceans were able to provide us with the amount of fish that we as a species eat, aquaculture wouldn't exist. And the truth is, is that the oceans are under severe pressure and it's why aquaculture has been created in the first place. And if you just think about me spending a whole day out there fishing to catch nothing, that's really what's happening to the oceans on a massive scale. And if I was to feed my family off the fruits of my labor, they would be starving. And that's where aquaculture kicks in, you know? Those big pens with thousands of fish in it, they had to give us fish because we've ruined the oceans. And if we're smart enough to figure out how to breed fish in captivity, how to breed prawns and farm fish, one would think we'd be smart enough to look after our oceans. It's 5.30 in the morning and we're getting ready to leave to spend seven hours traveling from Krabo to the Great Karoo, to J.P. Smith's farm, Kariastomp, where we're going to be spending the next couple of days checking out an ancient contract between humans and our domesticated animals. Guys, you can bring this stuff, eh? If we don't get going, we're never going to get going. You ready, bud? <laughs> it's my coffee. It's coming. Let's get going. Human evolution. It kicked off for us when we were little more than scavengers. We lived off the land, learned to hunt and gather, all the while while trying our very best not to be eaten. As time ticked by, we moved up the food chain and got smart, or so we thought. Nowadays, well, we rely on others to produce our food and we do most of our hunting and gathering in supermarkets, unaware that our eating habits are having a massive impact not only on us, but on the environment as well. My name is Justin Bonello, and this is my journey to find out where the food I eat actually comes from. This is the plains of the Cam de Boo. This, once upon a time, was a jungle. And once upon a time, even before that, was a great sea. But what you see now is just the semi-arid desert. And the best part about the Karoo is if I shut up for just like two seconds, you'll hear the silence. JP's house is just 12, 13 kilometers that way. 
and let me tell you one thing about the Karoo there's nothing like a Karoo farmer's hospitality let's go well here we are the farm Karia Stomp and the Camdebu Plains near Aberdeen and this is where JP is we're a bit late it's dark but if we're lucky he might have a fire going maybe a bra JP <laughs> How you bud? It's good actually. Tired. But what an amazing day. Where do you get your stars from, man? That's beautiful, eh? Yeah. That's gorgeous. <sighs> nice to be here. You know, JP, I'm really looking forward to eating lamb chops from sheep that you farm. You know, and if you think about it, we've got this like ancient contract with the animals. You look after them, and I eat them with salad and potatoes. It's only nine o'clock on Sunday night, and JP's already gone to bed. Being a Sunday means tomorrow is a work day. And I volunteered to get up at 5.30 tomorrow morning and go with JP to the location to pick up the day workers that stay on the farm for the week. And then we're going to go out into the felt and cut sheep tails off and wean lambs from their mothers. So see you at 5.30. Morning, JP. Morning, mate. Sorry, I'm... Um... A little bit later, it's just getting up at farmer's hours that kill me, eh? <laughs> Five in the man. morning. Okay, let's go to work. So, JP, we're on our way to, to pick up, what do you call them? Dagloners. Loan workers. So what, you're pulling all these extra guys in now for, it's, it's the weaning of the lambs. Yeah, and uh, we're having a count again, because uh, we haven't been able to work with the sheep since before they started to lamb, because you don't want to be in between them while they're busy lambing. Um, how would you feel if you were pregnant and then someone irritated you the whole time? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Morning, man. It's now 7.30 and we've already been going for two hours. Now we're dropping the dach learners in the felt to start rounding up the sheep so it can dock the tails and inoculate them. And what happens if you don't dock the tails now? Well, if you don't cut it off, the blood flow will kind of sting and then they get worms. So, but uh, they get clemony cock. I don't know what that is. Clemony cock? It's tetanus. Well, this is where we become a shepherd. From here to where the copies, the little two other copies. No, not that far. Not that far, but towards that direction. Yeah, towards that direction, yeah. Can I become a shepherd? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bert. Good luck, man. Good we'll luck. See you later. Luck. Cheers. You know, the, the Karoo is big country. And today I find out exactly how big. Well, you and I do. Now there's four shepherds, including myself. I call myself a shepherd because I'm here. <laughs> One that side, me, and two more further away. And we're doing a sweep across here to get the sheep to the kraal, where we're going to dock the tails and inoculate them. Jonathan, by walking the fence on that side, pulled in three more sheep. One of them's without a lamb. This is the season that JP finds out what his mortality rate has been like. So jackals and lynx and natural causes and said to me can lose up to 40% of the lambs. It's one thing to uh, buy a pack of lamb chops from your supermarket. It's another thing completely to herd your lamb chops into an enclosure. When 
you say free reign, <laughs> this is it, man. This is JP, you weren't kidding about a little morning stroll, eh? <laughs> it's nice to wake up, eh? So this happens after the, the lambs are about eight weeks old. They dock the tails, both the males and females. They get a dose for worms, and then only the females get inoculated, but not the guys, because, well, the guys turn into lamb chops, but the, but the females, well, they keep those for breeding stock, so it's worth spending money on them. Can I help? <laughs> Dr. Benello. It's something to get used to, JP, man. You must be laughing at me, the city slicker now, eh? Eh? <laughs> 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 you is calling her lamb. One right here, and the lamb is hers right there. And you forget that it's a live, living animal with a, a mother, a father, <laughs> and a baby. And again, it's not like I'm not going to eat lamb. But I am definitely the lamb that I eat. I hope comes from a place like this. From the tails, you can tell how many lambs you have, and you can tell what your stock's doing, you know, whether it's going up or down. Dian, why so my roommate stack is to cook, man? Yeah, too. Yeah, they cook. Well, mop. Let them burn like this until all the hair is burnt off. It's warm, eh? See, the other men say you to pay for these stackies every day, eh? So it's eh. Get fungus from star, man. And and what eat you? Eat the whole thing, or not? Not not that. Not that. And it's sticky. You can feel the. I hope they cooked. So you eat not the fat and the flies off, man. But eat you the whole thing. Not the bee, not the bee. It's very fat, right? You can't eat any of them, not the one you eat. You have a few of them. Listen, it's meat, you know, and it's the reality of eating lamb, I guess. Thank you, man. Listen, it's not going to go high up on my list of finger snacks. But it's kind of like, if you're gonna cut the tails off, eat it. When you're not out here doing it yourself, it's just a piece of meat on a supermarket shelf. But when you're out here with the tails littering the ground, giving them injections, it's real. And there's a, a part of me that's quite traumatized, you know? Um, over there lies a pile of sheep's tails, and in a sense, I shouldn't be. You know, that's relatively humane. You know, these guys are still going to wander off into the felt and graze their merry lives away until they're fat enough to go to the abattoir. The only thing is that our contract with the sheep is a little bit dishonest. You know, wolves turn into dogs, turn into man's best friend. Sheep, on the other hand, turn into lamb chops. Am I not going to eat lamb anymore? I'm going to eat lamb, you know? But I think by purely being here today with JP, I'm going to have a little bit more respect for what I eat. It's six o'clock in the morning and already JP has gone to work. And let me just tell you, JP is a third generation farmer on these lands. And worldwide, 
family owned farms are falling every day. In America, only 1% of all farms are owned by families. The rest are owned by corporations. And there's a massive problem in that, in that if you look just at JP, he knows the land. He's not going to put it under pressure because ultimately it's his heritage. If he ruins the land here, he ruins that ancient contract which allows humans and the land to coexist. The majority of corporations, on the other hand, they're not interested in heritage or being custodians of the land. They're just interested in profits. Virtually as far as the eye can see is all JP's land, and he needs this much land for his sheep. If you overgraze this Karoo scrubland, it can take up to 10 years to recover, if it recovers at all. And in that sense, JP is a custodian, not only of this land, but of our future as well. You know, if he cocks it up here, he doesn't have a heritage for his family for generations to come. But we as a species don't have a place to grow our meat. And you must know that no farmer on the planet wants to ruin his land. Here comes JP. So I thought you only got up early when you uh, had to go and fetch the workers in the morning and there you are, gone already this morning before we gone. Yeah, well, extremely busy, man. Uh -huh. It's another day's hard work. You can see the first camps coming in from that side, is yeah. that right? So yeah. they're bringing those in now. So um, we've got a bit of a spit tonight, eh? Yeah, no, looking forward to it. Me too, actually. A little bit of a kaya, some career yeah. hospitality, eh? Yeah, you'll feel it. Will you take me for a drive around the farm today? No. Yeah, I want to check out some of like all the old houses and stuff that, yeah. we, that used to be houses, houses with Someone's people known. and yeah. You know. yeah, I'll show you. Do you ever get lonely, huh? Yeah, it gets lonely sometimes, but um, you get used to it. I mean, when you're married someday, you want to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> A few years back, the farm was supposed to be self-sustainable. I mean, you had land to to uh, plant your vegetables, you know, some oranges. You had your cows for milk. It just has become cheaper to go to the store and buy the, the milk there. But JP, isn't that like quite scary that it's it's cheaper for a farmer to go and get it than to do it himself? It is a problem. I mean, he has stayed four families, four families. On this road? Only on this road, yeah. How many stay here now? Nux. Nothing left, though. Well, that would have been the old homestead. Yeah, that's our homestead. You can imagine on a, on a hot day, whole family sitting out here, catering, maybe a loaf of bread baking inside. Yeah. No, you can, I mean. You see me that way. Unfortunately, not anymore. I mean, what happened? I mean, it just, it just wasn't viable anymore to stay here. Is this happening all across the Karoo? Ah, oh, most definitely, yeah. Yeah, it's strange to think that farmers take all the risks for the smallest rewards. We should be putting more in farmers' pockets and less in middlemen's pockets, mm. you know? People that don't know anything about farming, I mean, people that sit in offices, I mean, that... Have they putting ever shareholders got... above farmers. I mean, have they ever seen a lamb? <laughs> Dr. Tail, yeah. taking it to the slaughterhouse. I doubt it. It's extremely sad, man. She's in another... 50 years, JP, there won't even be evidence of no, this anymore. This won't be, here, man. be gone. We walk through the tree lined lane to someone's house. You can actually really feel that someone lived here. They planted yeah. every tree here. I mean, it'd be nice to drive through here and be greeted by someone. So come in, get some coffee. Come in, have a cup of coffee, yeah. here's a lacquer rusk. Hey, do you want a nice sandwich with some butter and jam? 
That's the thing about Karoo people, man. They are so... Gezellig. Yeah, gezellig. And what remains of it now? Dead Some trees. Some dead trees. I, I remember hearing stories of like a reverse Afrikaner migration. You know, whole families packing everything they had yeah, dear to them onto the back of a pickup and driving into the city. Near what, JP? Nothing left here, eh? But this one hasn't fallen down yet. No, it's about, I mean, you fix this house up uh, just when you bought it. So, because he thought it was a nice place and a nice shed and I mean, afterwards it just fell apart. Dusties and things have moved in here, right? No, no, they've taken over here. Yes, it's JP. And then from here onwards, JP, it's quicker. Once the roof goes, yeah, then the walls else. are mud, so all made out of old bricks. And drains inside. What's it you saying? The sun moved to England. Yeah, I mean the sun moved to England and never came back. Yeah. So the father sat in vain, waiting for his son to come back and take over his legacy. This is JP. Ik het gif in my gespeid, moe nie worry nie, ek gaan maar dood in die dorp. Ek kon nie anders nie... Baie amal. Baie amal. Yes, is that hectic, eh? I've put... I've injected poison into myself. Don't worry, I'm going to die in the town. Ek kon nie anders nie... I couldn't do other. I had no choice. That about sums it up. Sure, JP. So next stop, Hunty the Butcher to pick up our sheep for the split, bud. Yeah. Let's nice pop. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Andy. I'm Kanami Kenis, Justin Benilla. Bura. Bura, nice to meet you. Fearless. Fearless, Pluckies. Royan. Royan. And Sean. And Sean. You look at my young bro. It's the first time I've seen a sheep slaughtered. Okay. It's only. Oh, sorry, it's. I hope not. No, I don't think it's necessary to do that. No? Yeah. It's, okay. It's not too bad. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, this is a stunning pistol. Yeah. Okay. It's not a firearm, you don't need a license for it. Yeah. And uh, you just use it to... <laughs> oh, okay. He's unconscious as you would yeah. want it. Yeah. Then the next throat gets slit. Yo, it's the first time I've seen it. This is a, this is Those a... are like last nerve reactions yeah. now. Now you must give some time for the bleeding. To go down yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of blood, eh? Yeah, a lot of blood. So this is the bleeding area here. Yeah. How they will start there. And still, at this stage, no, no hooks direct in the in the flesh in, or in anything flesh like or that. Something. Now you will see they will move the skin here and then, and then we'll go peel it the open and then yeah. as, um, uh, open up the guts. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same as doing um, like a fish, no different. You yeah. know, you catch a fish, you, you kill it, yeah. and then you gut it, and you take out the guts. No different. No different, yeah. Still not as much blood. Yeah. The skin, Yeah. They, they take it off that this outside part stays on the outside, so there's no contamination of the outside part to this. To the to actual this, flesh. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that my first slaughtering of a sheep was with you. Thank you, thank you. I am. It seems the color of your face is still no, normal. So yes, no, listen, it dropped for a second. It was all like, yeah. 
but it was everything was humane. It was you yeah. know the, the the truth is we eat meat. Yeah. yeah. And if you eat meat, this is going to happen yeah. every single time. And you handle it well. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I didn't. Huh? Yeah. Okay, Yule. Are you? Yes, satisfied? we're done. That's brilliant. And there it is, clean carcass. Okay. This is um, similar to the one you're going to be putting on the spit later on. Yeah. Are you people familiar with something like roosterkoek? Roosterkoek, of course. Okay, shall we move? Yes, 100%. Thank you. Just follow me. I follow you, Hunt. Bye, thank you, Manier. We'll see you tonight. Yeah, we'll see you tonight. Okay, lekker. And remember, you carving tonight, eh? Okay, fine. Okay. That's our dinner tonight for 20 people. Okay, now we got to fly like the wind, eh? Auntie? Yeah, I'll see you a bit later, eh? Okay, bye. So my time with JP is coming to an end and in a couple of minutes I'm going to walk down the hill and have a good old Karoo Kea. You know, I've got a couple of other farmers and, and hunties coming in and we're going to have a celebration with one of the sheep from this farm. We're celebrating, it died, that's a fait accompli. But that's what food is really about, is that celebration of life and it's the sheep's life and, and our lives out here. And today was another eye-opener for me, you know. I can tell you that, yes, you must eat free-range lamb or chicken and things. But the truth is, is when you come out to a space like this, you come away with a bigger respect for farmers. And the sad thing is, is that here in the Karoo, they're a dying breed. Let's go have our spit. It's time for some true Karoo hospitality. It looks delicious, but it is delicious. That's the biggest question. You're doing a sterling job Are you satisfied there. satisfied with the carving? You're making me look like an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're not recording this. Eh? <laughs> yeah. I just want to make a quick toast to JP for having us all. Thank you, JP. Thank you for having our humble crew here. Thank you for butchering our meat for us, and thank you for growing it. Because <laughs> without it, it doesn't happen. But to JP, yeah, yeah. cheers, cheers. Now we can eat. Now everyone can eat. Yeah.